and a couple of angiograms. And this patient's probably back at work or at home right now. Today, breakthroughs in medical technology take on many different forms. By combining a working knowledge of anatomy, computer software, and animation, Tom Krakus is able to provide doctors with a three-dimensional, non-invasive way to detect and solve more complex problems. Your CAT scan, when it goes, when it circles around you, it takes a slice out and turns it sideways, like a loaf of bread. We have multi-slice detectors on these scanners, so when it goes around once, it actually cuts you 64 times. The computerized technology allows us to render this 3D image. From a single workstation, Tom Krakus is able to post his discoveries on a computer network that serves the six hospitals and 50 locations that form the Adventist's Kettering Health System around Dayton, Ohio. At the turn of the previous century, Charles F. Kettering was one of the most gifted inventors. He had more patents to his name than anyone else other than Thomas Edison. Innovation in technology is an integral part of, of what Charles F. Kettering was all about. He was always looking for answers to problems that technology could solve. This patient is about to benefit from advanced imaging. He has an aneurysm of the aorta that can be life-threatening. And if it suddenly ruptures, he's going to lose all of his blood into his belly in a matter of a few minutes. Yeah. And uh, more than half the time, he'll just die on the spot before he can get medical care. Well, the only way to treat this before we had the angiography suite would be to just open him up and do a major surgery. That would have a large incision. It would take weeks, maybe months, to recover from that. And if we can do this all through just a catheter, he could actually go home later today. That's pretty amazing. William, we're going to take a picture. I need you to not breathe. Hold very, very still. But before the procedure begins, Dr. Schwartz maps out his strategy with the use of 3D imagery. With the 3D modeling, it really helps us plan what to do with the patient. And a lot of times, it can cut down on other procedures and unnecessary work. I have physicians that tell me when we do the 3Ds, they are excited because they can now be far more precise. And when you see them concentrating on that image, their foremost element of mind is you do no harm. Here's your diameter just beneath the renal. Save that. So what he's doing directly impacts the care of a patient and what decisions the physician's ultimately going to make about their care. We could be better than that. You're, it's fun and you're helping people. It's great. The unfortunate thing about heart disease and with the, the majority of patients I see that this could be completely prevented with proper education and changes to lifestyle. When patients come in and I start talking to them about their lifestyle, at first when I go in and talk to them, the first thing I say to them is I won't ask you to do anything I don't do myself. And they breathe a big sigh of relief, thinking, oh, that won't be so bad. And then I start telling them that I'm a vegetarian, and I run six miles at least four days a week. I don't smoke, I don't drink. For physicians, the technology and the rate of information is just so fast that it's almost impossible to keep up. And so if people ask me, do you want to choose someone who's very technically competent and very up to date, or someone who's compassionate, I say, I want both. Because if you're committed to the patient, you're going to read up on the latest technology and how you can provide that in a skilled way to the patient who needs it. You know, when you're a doctor, you touch people when they're hurting. And you have an audience that really needs hope and healing and good news, someone to care, someone to help them feel better. Anytime you touch a patient's life, it's sacred. Life is sacred. I think the work is sacred because the work takes as its fundamental premise this idea that every human being matters. Every human being is sacred, has rights to care, rights to compassion and generosity that human beings are capable of. Why, are, why do those rights exist? They exist because we believe that God regards every human being as having sacred value. On the other side of the Kettering campus is the church, 
where people gather for Saturday Sabbath worship. By embracing the Seventh-day experience of the Sabbath, we exhibit our solidarity with the original Testament of Scripture and with the heritage of the Hebrew people. So what happened was Adventists became convinced that the right day for Christians to keep was not Sunday, the first day of the week, but the seventh day of the week. Sabbath would be an affirmation of creation. God rested at the end of creation and that enjoyed and took delight in what he made. That means the world is good, it's valuable, it ought to be affirmed and cared for. God's plan of 24 hours of sacred time is absolutely necessary for the human to fully thrive. It is the common knowledge that we share that every week we will put things aside, differences, and come together. There's something special about that rest where you say, okay, I am free today not to do laundry, free not to go to work, not to clean the house. This is a day that we worship and then we celebrate with our families. At this church and a growing number of congregations, a faith community nurse uses the day of gathering as an opportunity to provide health programs or simply take the pulse of their parishioners. In the past, churches used to be the place of healing. That's where people would come for healing. Deaconesses in the early churches were the people that um, did healing and were concerned about people with health issues. And as the years went by, somehow the church kind of lost that focus on healing. So one of the things that faith community nurses do is try to have the churches reclaim that ministry of healing. Deep in our history is the whole concept that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and they belong to God and we ought to care for them. Plato famously said that the body is the prison house of the soul. And that notion that somehow the soul is an ideal and the body is somehow a case in which the soul resides and that the relationship is kind of an unhappy relationship because the body pulls you down, that has affected the Christian tradition. We take the body to be essentially good. We may do bad things with it, but in its essence it is good. It is a gift of God. It may be related to another aspect of Adventist belief, and that is the fact that uh, human beings are essentially physical. That is to say, there is no part of us like a soul or a spirit that uh, lives independently from the body. So we are physical beings from beginning to end, and the future beyond death is a resurrection of the body. It's not an immortal soul that keeps on living. So once you've emphasized the body to that degree, then you begin to realize that taking care of the body is an extremely important thing to do. You had a birthday this month, didn't you? Yes. How old are you now? 90. 91. Okay. Are you on any blood pressure medication? No. No. Okay. You have to get older for that. Millie Mills is 92, and besides walking at least three miles a day, she has one more secret to a long life. I don't eat anything that has a mother. I think the Adventists are different when it comes to community in that this notion of a Saturday Sabbath um, sets them apart a little bit from everybody else. And because they're set apart, they tend to hang out more together. They tend to hang out with people with the same schedule and the same ideas. So this idea of eating a plant-based diet is reinforced. Ellen White also talked about that the diet that God gave Adam and Eve in Eden was the best. You didn't kill animals because there was no death. So you ate fruit, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Not much more than four decades ago, about 25% of Americans were overweight or obese. Now it's close to 70%. And most of that increase has been in the last 20 years. And the group that's actually growing the fastest is the morbidly obese. And by definition, that's people who are more than 100 pounds overweight. Dr. Heather Pena is a Harvard-trained physician at St. Helena Hospital in the lush wine country of Napa Valley, California. St. Helena is the oldest Adventist hospital, dating back to 1878, 
and in many ways it recalls the original sanitariums by combining a natural environment with healing. Since its beginnings, the hospital has been supported by area vintners, some of the leading names in the wine industry, despite the fact that most Adventists don't drink alcohol. St. Helena is a traditional hospital with a leading cardiac unit, but there is a strong focus on the workings of the mind and its role in a person's overall health. Uh, yeah, actually slept really well last night. There is a 29-bed psychiatric unit and a center for health that offers residential programs to help people overcome weight problems and a program to stop smoking that began in 1969 as one of the first of its kind in the nation. I probably started when I was about 12 years old and now I'm 52 and it's, you know, I've had some medical issues where it's, the light bulb has gone off and it's time to quit. What's the most important risk factor that you can change and improve a person's chances of being healthier and living longer? It is to stop smoking. It is the number one cause of avoidable death in this country. I usually show as a heavy smoker. Still. Yeah, still. The brain is interesting in that it repeats behaviors for which it gets a reward. So in my experience, people only are willing to change a behavior that gives them a reward when either life becomes so painful for them that they can't go on or they know that they're risking heart attack, stroke, you name it. It says that you've tried quitting 10 or more times. I've tried a lot of times, yes. 24 hours is, you know, kind of tough. It's brutal. I, I cannot now, at this point, make it a day. So what I happens can't make it a day. when you stop smoking, how soon do you start feeling uncomfortable? Uh, immediately. It's very odd. Right. You know, there's that mind yeah. thing right, like right away when I make that decision. More and more we're finding related to addictive types of behavior. There's a brain chemistry aspect to all of these that we're just now beginning to understand and to address. It's a myth that nicotine is harmful. Nicotine is what keeps people using tobacco because it's more addictive than any other substance known to mankind. But nicotine by itself has been shown to cause medical diseases. It's all the other chemicals that lead to the cancer, emphysema, coronary artery disease, and strokes. Good. Doing well. Your heart rate just reached the first target. Okay. So we achieved that. And your electrocardiogram looks great. So you're doing very well. Dr. Pena directs a weight control program Good. called Transformation. <laughs> Over 11 days of regular monitoring, lectures on diet and healthy eating, and exercise, people begin to make the changes in their lives that for many have become necessary. There are five things that if people do these five things, you can cut the risk of cancer by 70%. Cancer. And those five things are to exercise regularly, maintain your ideal weight, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat less red meat, and to not smoke. Now, how, what percentage of Americans do all five? Three percent. We need to focus much more on helping people accomplish those five goals. We'll make huge impact on the health in the United States. I've gained 50 pounds and had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, pre-diabetic, and I just wanted to get cleaned up. Literally gotten yourself We've analyzed now almost 400 people, and what we find is that the blood sugars drop about 12 percent, the blood cholesterol drops 15 percent, the triglycerides drop almost 30 percent. If you take the uh, combination of how we've helped folks with many addictions, such as drugs, alcohol, smoking, even weight loss challenges, there's over 20,000 people that have come through our programs here. When we think about helping people with addictions, it's all about giving them courage. I feel good.
Here at St. Helena Hospital, we have uh, an inpatient psychiatric unit, 21 beds. We also have 39 beds dedicated to our St. Helena Recovery Center for the treatment of alcohol problems and drug addictions. The general statistics that come out of the uh, United States uh, Health and Human Services Agency as well as the National Institute for Mental Health uh, state that about one in four uh, adults in the United States has a defined uh, mental, mental issue, mental disorder, whether it's mild depression to anxiety all the way up to what we see in our hospital, major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Mental health, I would classify it as a chronic disease with acute episodes, very similar to diabetes. The mentally ill individual is coming into us with severe symptoms that we then manage on the inpatient unit, and then the expectation is that they'll be, uh, they'll work with their medications, that they'll go into therapy, uh, they'll get additional supportive treatment in their communities to manage this chronic disease. There's still some feelings that there's a volitional aspect, there's a self-control aspect to mental illness. If the person would only pick themselves up by their bootstraps, and that's not it at all. These are really chemical reactions in the brain as an organ that are creating behaviors that folks have a hard time controlling on the outside. This is really a disease. Our goal is to get the person out of the hospital and back into a more normalized life. Treatment works. Four months ago, Dr. Leonard Bailey performed an operation on baby David in the hope a donor heart could be found. Finally, the call came. It's a big day for uh, David. Doesn't get any bigger. The infant donors come from either sudden infant death or a lot of them do come from abuse, I'm sorry to say, in this country. And others.